chapter 12, verse 24. That's a lot of fun. Thank you, Brother Stephen, for that announcement. And uh, I am excited about that. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24. The Bible says there, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, Lord, thank you for today. And what a great song that is and what a great truth. And uh, what blesses my heart is a young man singing it. Amen? Not being shamed or intimidated, that's a blessing. And uh, praise the Lord for that. If I could have a couple of ushers come and uh, pass out some uh, handouts here, that'd be great. There we go, get a couple of guys doing that. That would be wonderful. All right, my heart is blessed tonight as uh, the ushers pass those out. Uh, I was just thinking up here, uh, this is a wonderful group of folks on a Wednesday night when churches are canceling Wednesday night services. Uh, what a blessing it is to see people come out and uh, just loving church and loving God. That's what you're doing. You're loving the Lord. And uh, bless your hearts for that. You're an encouragement to one another. Your faithfulness is an encouragement. And uh, Abala, God bless you. Good to see you here tonight. Yes, God bless you. And Matthew, too. Thank the Lord. And Awili. Yes, that is a blessing. And uh, good to see you folks here. And another thing that blesses my heart is uh, men and women that get off work and come right into church. And uh, there, there's not much time for any preparation as far as eating or, or um, anything else, you just get right to the church house and you could say, well, I'm just going to skip because I just got home from work, but you don't. And uh, Brother Luke got off a little bit late tonight and he called me and he said, hey, can Brother Stephen lead songs for me? I said, absolutely. But, uh, you know, he could have just said, you know, nobody knows, I'll just stay home and uh, I'm off work late, but uh, here he is tonight and that blesses my heart. And uh, God bless you men for coming in. Uh, even when you get off late, and uh, ladies getting all the kids uh, rallied together and in the vans or in the cars or in the minivan, whatever it is, and getting to the church house, that's a blessing. Then I look down here and I see the boys, what a blessing that is. Uh, you know, it blesses my heart to see young men dressed up for church. I mean, got their, the tie on. I look back there, James has a suit and tie on. Amen. That's good, James. It looks great as well. God bless you. And uh, that kind of stuff doesn't go unnoticed. I recognize that. And it takes a little bit of effort, but those are the little things that really count. And uh, God bless you for that. What a blessing. Encouragement to your pastor's heart. Let's go over there to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 24. The Bible says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the, what's the next word? Uh, Slothful shall be under tribute. The slothful shall be under tribute tonight. We're going to be dealing with the topic of the slothful man. There's 14 different men that we will be uh, uh, meeting in the book of Proverbs. I should say people, not men, because there's some ladies that we're going to be covering as well. And uh, 14 different individuals that we will meet. And tonight we find the new character introduced in Proverbs chapter 12, and he is identified as the slothful man, the slothful man. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, we ask that you bless now, bless the Bible study. Lord, none of us desire to have any traits of the slothful man tonight. God, thank you for the diligent men and women of our church who have served you over the years and have a wonderful testimony. God, I pray that you'd help tonight's study to keep our eyes open uh, t uh, about the uh, different traits that may want to slip into our lives that link us to the slothful man, Lord, and maybe we be prudent uh, this evening in that way. In Jesus' name we pray these things, and amen. We have the most prominent characteristic of the slothful man is that he lacks the passion, and uh, he lacks passion, and he also is idle in his behavior. Very... Uh, idle in his conduct. There is no passion, no zeal behind uh, his actions. The company of the slothful man is unpleasant. It is not fun to be hanging out with a slothful man. You say, why? Because you do all of his work for him. And there you are. You become his servant, whether you want to be or not. You uh, are his servant because he's idle and he doesn't want to lift a finger to help in the situation. So although the slothful man has the ability 
and the skill to accomplish the task that is at hand. Uh, he lacks the initiative uh, to take, uh, uh, it takes to accomplish the task. He lacks the initiative. Boy, don't you love initiative? Uh, that spirit, uh, that, that initiative spirit. You say, what is that dealing with? An, an initiative spirit is one that sees something that needs to be done uh, and just does it. They don't have to be asked. They don't have to be told. Uh, they just see it and they get it done. That's a blessing. Moms, uh, you enjoy an initiative uh, spirit around the house. When a child is told, okay, pick up the toys, and they pick up one toy, and then they just stand there waiting for the next instruction. All right, go ahead and pick up all the toys. All right, we got to explain every toy to you to make sure you pick them all, pick them all up. But an initiative uh, spirit is a tremendous blessing. Christians who are slothful are very bad testimonies for Christ. Very bad testimonies for Christ. There are four characteristics of the slothful man I'm going to give you tonight. Many of them are formed in their youth, in their childhood. There's a, a pattern of slothfulness that develops, and then they carry that right into their adult years. And so slothfulness is something we want to stay away from. It gives Christ a bad testimony. Let me give you the first one here. Number one, slothfulness is fueled by excessive rest. Slothfulness is fueled by excessive rest. Slothfulness is introduced into one's life through excessive rest, excessive sleeping, excessive uh, 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 idleness. Rest is a God-given gift. Thank the Lord for it. Amen? Amen. Nothing wrong with, with uh, rest. But when abused, it becomes a man-made monster. And it, control, it can control an individual and really drain the life out of a person. Uh, if if a, an individual sleeps more than what their body uh, requires, then uh, the person becomes sluggish. Man, I'm so tired. You've ever had one of those, one of those uh, holidays? Maybe you thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get an extra couple hours of sleep here. And as a result of it, you're tired all day long. Man, what happened? Oh, this, is, this is a holiday and I'm exhausted. Sometimes rest, well, excessive rest can rob a person of their, lively, uh, uh, their liveliness in their life. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, How long wilt thou sleep, O, uh, what's the next word? Sluggard. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands uh, 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 to sleep, the Bible says. And so the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 15, slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Proverbs 26, verse 14, As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the uh, slothful upon his bed. Flop, 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 flop. The door swings back and forth. The person flops from side to side. On his bed, the slothful or slothfulness is fueled by excessive rest, excessive sleep. We find a story in the Old Testament, Ahab. Ahab saw a vineyard that was hard to the palace of his or hard to his palace. In other words, it butted right up to his palace and he would look out the window and he'd see this beautiful garden, this beautiful vineyard. And Naboth was the owner of that that uh, vineyard. And Ahab wanted that vineyard. And so he went to Naboth and he said, please, would you give me that vineyard? Either, either let me buy it from you or I will give you a better vineyard. Either one you choose. Uh, but I really want that vineyard. That's a beautiful vineyard. And so the Bible says, uh, Naboth said, uh, God forbid uh, that I should give my father's inheritance to you. It was against, it was against the Mosaic law. So he said, no, absolutely not. Well, Ahab's response, watch this. Ahab's response there in Kings, the Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 21, 
verses uh, 1 through 4. I'm going to read verse 4, it says. And he laid him down upon his bed. Okay? He got the no. And so Ahab was very upset. Let me bump up just a little bit. It says, And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jebusite had spoken unto him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed. Watch this, this uh, response. And turned away his face and would eat no bread and sucked his thumb. Oh, I'm sorry. Almost <laughs> says that. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's what the king did. He, won Naboth, he wanted Naboth's vineyard. He asked him for it. Naboth said, absolutely not. He marched into his house. Can you imagine marching into the house, going up to his bed, laying down on his bed? We're talking, I'm not talking about a kindergartner or a third grader. I'm talking about the king of Israel going in, laying on his bed, turning himself, looking to the wall. And then when the servants come and say, king, it's time to eat, go away. I just can't face food right now. Please leave me alone. Huh? Can you imagine that? That's because when slothful people or slothful people, when depressed or discouraged, they resort to laziness. Slothful people, when depressed or discouraged, they resort to laziness. Now, there's nothing wrong with good rest. And if you, if there's been a long period, sometimes there's long periods that you enter into and uh, it's a long uh, period of time before you get rest and you crash out and you sleep for several hours. There's nothing wrong with that. God gives rest. God, it's, it's a gift. God giveth his servants rest. But rest is a God given, is a God given gift. But when abused, it is a man made monster. You want to become depressed? Just sleep in every day of the week. You talk about being depressed. That will, that will throw you into depression. You want to be discouraged? You sleep in uh, every day uh, of the week and you don't have anything scheduled for the, for the day. Um, it's a very discouraging, very depressing uh, uh, time for an individual. And so what do you have to do? You have to take what God has given you. Uh, don't abuse it. Enjoy it. And thank God for it. Rest is a God-given uh, uh, gift, but it should not be abused. It must not be abused. Otherwise, it slips into slothfulness. Jesus did not come to earth to be slothful, but to work. I want, to, I want your attention to be drawn over to John chapter 9 and verse 4. He said, I must, what's the next word? Work. work. I must work. This is Jesus. This is God in the flesh. I must work. Jesus was a hard worker. Can you imagine how strong Jesus Christ would have been as a, as a carpenter? He was not a lazy man. He was a very strong man as he would uh, do the different responsibilities uh, there in the shop and do the different responsibilities that he had to do uh, uh, for that kind of uh, occupation. Jesus Christ worked hard. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, uh, the night cometh when no man can uh, work. It's, Jesus Christ came and he exemplified uh, a great work ethic. Jesus Christ was a very hard uh, worker. As parents, it is important for us to teach our children a good work ethic. That is one thing that they will uh, take with them the rest of their life, a good work ethic. So it, is, it, 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 uh, it does not come natural, especially for boys. Boys are born lazy. I'll say it again. Boys are born lazy. You know why? Because it's God's command for the man to work. And so naturally, we don't like what we have been placed on us. And that's work. And so, fellas, young men, for you to learn how to work hard and not complain and be thorough in your work is very, very important. A good work ethic will move you all the way through your company. It'll move you up. It's the best thing you can bring to a job site is a good work ethic. I thought it was a bologna sandwich. No, no, not a bologna sandwich. A good work ethic. That'll get you to uh, 
uh, a place where you can be blessed in the company. Slothful behavior. Let me go through just a couple of things. Uh, parents, as we watch our kids uh, and we give them responsibilities, uh, we must watch for slothful behavior. Number one, not finishing the job. Not finishing the job. Not finishing the job. Giving them a task. Maybe it's go out and rake the leaves. And so, oh, right now it would be go out and shovel the driveway. Amen. Go out and shovel the driveway. And the, sho- the, the driveway is shoveled halfway or three-quarters of the way or 90% of the way. And it's not done completely. Are they fulfilling the job thoroughly? Are they doing it all the way? Slothful behavior starts the job but will not finish the job. Number two, slothful behavior will not pick up after themselves. So you get done shoveling the driveway. Uh, where's your shovel go? In the snowbank. Well, that's the end of that snowfall. Woo! Hopefully there's no more snow, right? No, no. A picking up after themselves when you get done with the job to put the tools back where they came from, to put the uh, utensils back where they came from, ladies, or where whatever you're using to put it back so that there's good, diligent behavior there. Number three, not, uh, not staying to the end, not staying to the end. Well, I'll help out with that. And so they help for a little while. And then uh, uh, an individual keeps on working to shovel out the driveway. Uh, and then one leaves and goes inside and gets the hot cup of coffee or hot, hot uh, cup of hot cocoa, amen, something like that. And they don't finish the job. A slothful individual will show up, chat a little bit, throw in a hand here or there, and then leave before the job is done. I, I know this is so simple, but really, folks, yeah. this is where our kids live. This is either we are watching them fulfill the job all the way or we're watching them cut out early. We're watching them put the things back or we are following them putting the things back. Huh? This is where our young people live. And it's very important that we train them. I have different, uh, different trades come in and I'll, 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 I'll have them give different bids on different or quotes on different projects like the drywall. Uh, the brick work that we had done last year, Uh, different things like that. And they'll come in and and I'll ask them, how is the trade going? Do you have plenty of good help? They always say, no, I can't find uh, young men uh, that will work. I can't find, or they'll show up and then uh, for a couple of days and then they they don't show up, don't call. They're just not there. No call, no show. And I think to myself, man, that is a horrible, uh, 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 horrible trait for a young man to have. Or they come in late, can't show up until, you know, 15, 20 minutes late. Be there at 8 o'clock and they pull in at 8.15. All of that, those are traits of slothfulness. And so it's very important that we teach our young men to be on time, to finish the job, to be thorough in their work. And if it's not thorough, then make them do it again. They can go out and shovel the driveway again. And if it's not, uh, if the tools aren't picked up, put away, and they're in bed, Dad, when you get home, what happens? Hey, time for you to get up. I saw a shovel out there. Go pick up that shovel. Oh, it's cold out there. I'm in my pajamas. It's warm in my bed. I don't care. You left a shovel out. You go get that shovel and you put it away. huh? That builds character. It is so important that we are building the character of our kids. Unless, moms and dads, unless we want our kids to be living with us when they're 30 years old and they've got, you know, their place. and It's our basement somewhere down there and, and uh, they're playing in the Nintendo games uh, and having a good old time uh, in mom and dad's home. Uh, and they pay rent, yep, $100 a month, and it really help everything out, huh? <laughs> help us. Or here's another trait of slothful behavior, sloppy work, sloppy work. Young people, you know where your work is right now? The bulk of your work is in your schoolwork. That is your job right now. 
your, your homework, your, uh, your paperwork, that's your school. You go, you go for eight hours of schooling or six hours of schooling, whatever it is. That is your work. And uh, it is important that you're not slothful in your schoolwork, sloppy handwriting. We go through all this kind of stuff in, in chapel. It's important. Sloppy handwriting or the, the questions that say, uh, do the problem and check your work. Well, I just do the problem. I don't check the work. Hold on, hold on. That is slothful behavior, and it must be corrected. Otherwise, if we let it slip, they will do it in bigger things in life, and it'll just continue to progress. <clears throat> I think it's very important uh, for us, us parents to go through our children's homework see what kind of handwriting they're writing with. Is it, is it progressing or is it digressing? It, are they just rushing through it? I go, I go through every sheet that my kids fill out. They always enjoy gathering around and we go through all the papers. Huh? And sometimes we go through and say, okay, hey, this, the handwriting is getting a little bit sloppy. You're rushing. Slow down. Write the L's straight. Write them correct. The S's need to look a little bit better. So, man, that's awfully picky. It's important for their character. And I only get one chance to raise my kids. And you get one chance to raise your kids. And once they turn 18, 19, 20 years old, they're out and they get fired from this job and they're laid off at this job and they get fired at this job. Maybe they have a couple of kids and you think, oh, Lord, help my grandkids. Son, what in the world? Daughter, what in the world? Get to work. Work hard. Make sure you have a good work ethic. It's too late then. You can't go back and retrain them. It's very important that we, they get the good work ethic in their youth so that there's no regret in the future. Brother Vineyard used to say this. Tired men, uh, what is it, Brother John? Rule. That's right. Tired men rule the world. He'd always tell us that. When we're in college, you know, your, your eyes are, are halfway closed all the time, it seems like. And uh, he said, tired men rule the world. You think, man, I'm not ruling nothing. <laughs> and I'm exhausted. I'm not ruling nothing. So tired men rule the world, Brother Vineyard would tell us all the time. Gideon and his 300 men, they went off to war. The Midianites, the Bible says they uh, put them uh, on the flight. And they were pursuing after them. And the Bible says in Josh, uh, Judges chapter 8 and verse 4, And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and the 300 men that were with him faint yet, what? Pursuing. Faint yet pursuing them. Uh, Joshua or, or uh, Gideon was exhausted. The 300 men were exhausted. And they wanted to quit. But they couldn't. They pursued after him. Young men, there's going to be a time in your life when you're working on a project. You're going to say, phooey on this. I'm exhausted. But you can't. You got to stick with it. Don't be slothful. Don't give up. Ladies, same thing. I'm exhausted. I don't want to do this. But you don't have an option. You've got to push on. Faint yet. What is it? Pursuing. Faint yet pursuing. And so uh, Gideon gives us a great example of a man who is not slothful. Number two, slothfulness is, waste, is wasteful because of lack of, val uh, of value. Slothfulness is wasteful because of lack of value. The value of an object is based on how much you give or labor for it. The value of an object is based on how much you give or labor for it. If it does not cost you any money or labor, you will not value it as much as you would have if you would have paid for the object or the item. That is the problem with the welfare programs. <clears throat> A brand new home, and if it's just given to an individual... It won't be very long before the home is destroyed. Holes are in the drywall and the lights are busted out and cracked window and the door is hanging off its hinges, so on and so forth. Why? Because I value what I pay for and what I labor for. Huh? A young person that buys their first new car, what do they do? 
They make sure that they park in a very safe place. Nobody's going to dent their doors. Nobody's going to scratch their car. Everything's going to make, they're going to make sure that everything is just right in their car. Why? Because they spent their hard-earned money to purchase the car. Now, mom and dad's car, put it in park, slam the door. Oh, man, it got dented. Oh, well, hope mom and dad's okay with that and keep on going, right? But when it's their car, oh, my goodness. Why? Because they paid the money. Huh? Mrs. Chop, am I, am I hitting a nerve here? Okay. <laughs> Katie. <laughs> Katie's back there just, <laughs> oh, man. How true. All of you parents, you know what I'm talking about that have had the kids drive your cars. Huh? Why are the tires low? Can't you stop and fill up the tires with air? Why are you driving them flat? <laughs> or it goes on, huh? But uh, if you pay for it, if you labor for it, you value it that much more. Why? <clears throat> Why is food wasted? Why is food wasted at the lunch line at public schools? You talk about a disgrace to our country. All the food that's being pitched. I think... Ms. Jacobson, you told me one time at the kindergarten, kindergarten through third grade or something like that, you were shocked at all the food, not even touched, full, full packages being pitched. You know why that is? Because they didn't work for it. You work and you get the, you get the amount of food, uh, the, the, the portion of food is based on how much work you do. I promise you, you won't be pitching any of that food. It'll be very, very, apple slices, oh my, it'd be like gold wedges for you if you work for it, huh? But the kids are thinking, oh, apples, ah, bananas. Oh, who likes bananas anyways? Throw that away, huh? things like that. But it's, it, they don't value it because they don't work for it. R it ruins, it ruins the, or they ruin the possessions because there is no value for what they receive. I'm not saying everyone, but I'm saying a good portion of it because it goes with the biblical principle, if you don't work, you don't eat. And when we cut out that trait, we cut out that principle in our society, people do not value what they have just received, a handout, they don't value that as much. Why? Because they don't work for it. Proverbs 12 and verse 27 says, The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of the diligent man is precious. The slothful man, it's talking about food here, has a, a deer in front of him or has whatever in front of him, a rabbit, and he looks at the food and says, Ah, too much work skinning and butchering and all that kind of stuff. My goodness, so bloody anyways. I'm going to throw it in the ditch. Huh? That's what the slothful man says. But the diligent man, he says, oh, it's a deer. Wow, I get to butcher this thing. I'm still waiting for that day to happen. Huh? That'll be a great day. <laughs> uh, yes, the slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting. Proverbs 18 and verse 9, it says, he also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is great, what? Waster. waster. Great waster. A lot of waste going on. If it's not valued. Let me give you a couple of shocking statistics with welfare. <clears throat> 2000, I think this was 2015 when the stat came out. Excuse me, 2017. It says, nearly 52.2 million people, United States uh, citizens, were on welfare. 52.2 million individuals were on welfare. That's 21.3%. That's a lot of folks. That's a lot of folks on welfare. 2014, food stamps. Each year, $42.5 million is given out in food stamps. Now, I'm not against programs that help people in legitimate need. There's nothing wrong with that. But when it becomes a system and learning the system and figuring out, oh, I can work the system, I do this, and then I don't do this, and then I can get back on, 
and then I'm off, and I get back on, get off. The tendency for individuals to work the system and become slothful is a great percentage when you get locked into that welfare system. That's why, and you know what it does? You know what it does, child of God? It strips you of dignity. Strips, it strips you of dignity. That's the, the, old, the old preacher got up and he preached that message from debt to dignity, from debt to dignity. Some of you have heard that. Man, what a great, great message. That widow uh, there that had uh, the debts and she had just a pot of oil. He said, go get you a bunch of pots, borrow as many pots as you can get and start filling up those pots and go out and sell them and get the money that you need to pay off your debts. Go work for it. He didn't say, oh, here, you need some money? Let me give you. How much did you need anyways? Oh, yeah, that much? Okay, here you go. He didn't do that. He made her work for it because uh, he knew that just a handout strips individuals from dignity, uh, from er the respect that they have uh, of themselves. This is what I have uh, because I went out and I worked for it and it was hard. Uh, it's long hours, but I worked for it and it's mine uh, and I have dignity in what I have. And welfare strips that of uh, individuals. And I feel bad for folks when they get hooked on that. And I, I have sat down, I've told you the story, sitting down with the individual and he said, yeah, if I work though, then I don't get my $800 from SSI. I said, throw SSI out the window. You can make $1,600. That's far more than a double what you're getting right now. No, no, that's free money. This is money I'd have to work for. I said, fooey, huh? Why? Because it's ingrained in them. And don't get hooked. Uh, it, 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 is, it is very uh, addicting. The welfare mentality is very addicting. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Number three, slothfulness forges excuses to uh, uh, replicate wisdom. Uh, slothfulness forges excuses to replicate wisdom. To replicate wisdom. Watch this. The, uh, the slothful man does not want people to identify him as slothful. Correct? Yeah. Who wants to stand up and say, identify me with the slothful man? Nobody wants that. Huh? So the slothful man does not want to uh, be identified with the slothful. So he will forge excuses that seem to himself as wise reasons for his slothful behavior. Did you catch that? Man does not want to, or a lady does not want to be identified with the slothful, so he will forge excuses uh, that seem to himself as wise reasons for his slothful behavior. <clears throat> an excuse, Billy Sunday would say this, an excuse is a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. A skin of a reason stuffed with a lie, huh? Billy Sunday used to say that. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4, it says, The sluggard shall not plow by, what's the next word? Reason. Yeah. By reason. Oh, have a reason. It's, oh, it's cold out there. My goodness, and the wind is blowing. A bad day for a plow. Bad day. We'll do it tomorrow. 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 What in the world, there's snow out there. Isn't that amazing? Huh? Yeah, the slothful man will not plow by reason of cold. If I went around the room, and, and I, I want to say this. I thank God for the hardworking men of our church. That is not, I, I'm not, I'm not hitting this, uh, this individual because we have issues. I'm hitting it because that's the next thing in line. But I thank God I look around the room and I see hardworking men. And I know some of you are up 3 o'clock in the morning. Huh? Brother Jacobson, that's his favorite hour of the day or something like that. Huh? Loves the morning hours, heads to work. Yeah, I know you work very hard, but this, these are just Bible principles here that we must keep in mind. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Today is not a good day for work because, because is the sluggard's or the slothful reason that he will produce. Therefore, shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Or when the mortgage comes, ah, man. There were 25 cold days this week, this, this month. I couldn't work those 25 cold days, so now I don't have any money for a mortgage. Sorry. Call them up and they'll explain it. They'll understand. The mortgage company is very understanding about those different things, cold, Minnesota, you know. 
Proverbs 22, verse 13 says, The slothful man saith, There's a lion without. I shall be slain in the street, no doubt. I'm going to be dead, so I might as well just stay inside, uh, and I can have another cup of coffee, have another cup of hot cocoa later on, huh? So the sluggard, the Bible says, uh, identifies wrong, uh, or danger and, and says, you know, that might be a, a problem. I may die out there. be horrible for the family to go, live on without me. So I don't think I'll leave the house. I'll just stay right here. Slothful man. Proverbs 26 and verse 16. The sluggard is wise in his own. What's the next word? Conceit. Hmm. That's interesting. Why is in his own conceit? In other words, in his own reasoning, I can figure out a way not to go to work and I can make it really, I can make it sound really, really important. But listen, the need for work is greater than the excuse for not going to work. Man, you got people to provide for. You got a family. You have kids that need to be helped and, and raised and, and so on and so forth. There is no opportunity to just say, you know, I'm just going to kick back and rest and, and uh, get this situation taken care of. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the bills keep on coming in, do they not? Yeah, whether you like it or not. Please don't send me another one of these letters anymore. Thank you. P.S. Appreciate the correspondence in the past. No longer needed in the future. Huh? It does, it does, it's not going to work. And so... The Bible says the sluggard is, wise, is, is wiser in his own conceit than seven men uh, that can render a reason. In other words, watch this, watch this. The sluggard stands and he gives a reason why he's not able to work. I'm, I'm not able to do that here. And there's seven people reasoning. No, you got to, you got to, you got to do this, you got to do this. And all seven of them can tell him, you've got to do this. But in his own conceit, doesn't hear him. Blind in his own conceit. So the slothful forges excuses uh, by uh, 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 replicating wisdom. The Bible says uh, there we must, or, or Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 16, the sluggard is wise, is wise in his own conceit. We must be careful uh, not to become a habitual excuse maker because we will never see where we really are if we are always covering up for it. We've got to be honest. Where am I? Where am I? Is this, is this really uh, something that I need to work on? Number next here. Slothfulness is not laziness. It is loss of inner passion. Slothfulness is not laziness. It is loss of inner passion. The natural response to this topic here tonight is, I'm not lazy. But slothfulness isn't laziness. It's a loss of inner passion in an individual. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, not slothful in business. See the next phrase? Fervent in spirit. That's right. Fervent in spirit. Boy, don't you love meeting a young person that's just full of fervor in their spirit? I enjoyed tonight's special. Fervor in spirit. Fervent in spirit. Boy, excited about serving the Lord. I enjoy the young people in TNT going through a Q&A session with them. Or, or uh, this past week, uh, uh, there was a, a contest that we had, some Bible quizzing going on. Man, I enjoy that. Their passion for the things of God and how important that is for the young people. How important that is for all of us. Fervent in spirit, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, fervent in spirit. So slothfulness is not laziness. It is rather the loss of inner passion. Hebrews 6 and verse 12 says that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promises. Slothfulness, it means dull. It means tardy. It means lack of fervor or inner passion. A sloth has not stopped, but rather, uh, a sloth has not stopped, but rather moves slow. A sloth doesn't stop. It's, it's still moving. 
very slowly. Huh? Yeah. And uh, when a child of God or an individual loses their passion, they slow down in the things of God. They, they are not as zealous for the Lord. When an individual becomes slothful, it may not be uh, that he or she quits doing right, but rather that they lose their fervor in right doing. It's not that they quit. It's the excitement. It's the passion that you lose. When you lose the passion, all of a sudden, uh, it's not as exciting to you and the intensity is not there and the slothfulness can slip in. We lose our edge, the crispness, huh? the edge uh, that you desire to have. You lose your passion. You lose your zeal. Out soul winning, uh, when you lose, when you become slothful in your soul winning, you, you lose your edge at the door. It's very important that you keep your edge yeah. and stay sharp when you're presenting the gospel because you're not presenting yourself, you're presenting God. Right. What a blessing. Yeah. And so I must keep my passion. I must keep my fervor and my intensity high. Otherwise, I lose my edge. I lose my passion. I lose my zeal. That's why Paul said to the church of Rome, he said, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Christians, we may never lose, we cannot afford to lose our passion or our edge in our walk with the Lord. We can't afford that. Can't afford that. Satan is waiting. As soon as you lose your edge, you lose your passion. He is waiting there. He's waiting to knock you out. And he, does, he doesn't care how long it takes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Even, even 50 years of marriage, he, he doesn't mind splitting up a, a couple that had been married for 50 years. And it's not unheard of either. He doesn't mind splitting up a couple after 30 years of marriage. We must make sure we stay fervent in our walk with God and are fervent in our, our service to God. Fervent, keep the edge and our love for the brothers and sisters in Christ. Not get a heart that is accusing our brothers or sisters. Uh, a passion for our love for our spouse. A passion for our child rearing and let's never lose that. Boy, even as you get older, as, uh, as uh, parents, as we get older, it's easier to let up the reins just a little bit. Not be as uh, structured with those last few kids. Uh, it's very important that we toe the line uh, with the last one just like we did with the first one. Uh, because uh, it's easy to lose our edge to become slothful in uh, the child rearing. We have a man, a perfect example of one who became slothful. I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass at the end of the, when, uh, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent out Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged uh, Rabbah. The Bible says, but David, see the next word, tarried still at Jerusalem. You know what happened? David's, David lost his edge. David lost his fervor for the fight. And David found himself in a heap of regret. It started, it started the murder in his home. It, it had death. It brought death into his home. Very, very sad commentary because... He lost the edge. He lost his passion. He lost his zeal, his fervor for the fight. It's a sad commentary. And now, placed with the name of King David, the great, great king of Israel, is adultery and murder. Why? He lost his edge. That's not because he decided it's no longer worth it. He just decided to be slothful just a little bit. Slothfulness can cost us a whole lot. And as God's people, we don't want to become slothful in business. We must stay fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed.